So, hello and welcome to this ARMA webinar on care and support planning for people with musculoskeletal conditions. My name is Sue Brown and I'm the Chief Executive of the Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Alliance, ARMA. We are an umbrella body that brings together patient and professional groups to work for better health services for people with musculoskeletal conditions. Before we get started, we just want to find out who we have on the line today. So we're going to do a couple of very quick polls, um, starting with just finding out who you are and where you work. So if, if those who can see the poll on their screens could just quickly let us know um, who they are. I can see people are starting to vote on these. We've got quite a range of people, which is what we usually get with an, with an ARMA webinar. Um, and quite a split in terms of where people work. So I'm just gonna end the polling and share the results. And I can see that um, the largest group of people on this webinar are commissioners, which is fantastic, but we've got a whole range of other roles. Um, and interestingly, other is our biggest category of where people work, uh, but we've also got people from primary community and secondary care. So then our second poll today is just to find out how much you might already know about the subject that we're going to be talking about and what's happening in your area. So again, if people can just answer those questions, give us an idea of how much understanding of care and support planning you have and whether there's any happening in your patch. This is something that is a national ambition set out in the NHS mandate that everyone with a long-term condition should be offered the care and support plan. But I think it's fair to say that things go at different speeds in different areas, so it will be interesting to find out who's in an area where there's lots going on and who's in an area where it's still not really got going. So again, I'm just going to end that polling and share the results. So I can see that we've got some people who know little or nothing about this. Um, and the largest group, about half of you have some idea of the basics of care and support planning but no more than that. And about 40% of you are in an area where there is a little bit happening. About a quarter of you say, yes, there's lots going on. Um, and then 20% of you say there's nothing going on in your area that you're aware of. So we've got quite a broad range of expertise and knowledge and what's actually happening locally. But I think you will all get something out of this webinar today. So having done that, I'm now going to introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Nick Lewis Barnard, who is the National Clinical Lead for the Year of Care Partnerships Programme. So I'm going to now hand over to you, Nick. Hi, hi Sue. Can, can, can I be heard? Are we, are we all sound yep. right? Yep. Good. Sounds hi. Fine. So, so welcome to everybody. I haven't seen the actual bar charts that, that Sue has produced, but thank you for for joining us and it's fantastic to have such a wide range of people with us. Um, I think partly because your roles are quite varied and also because your experience is clearly quite varied. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of time uh, in the beginning of this uh, presentation really just to make sure that we're all on roughly the same page about what care and support planning is and then to think a bit about how it applies in the context of musculoskeletal conditions which is a huge uh, as, I'll, as I'll say, slightly under, um, under, uh, uh, under provided area in terms of this. So I'm, I'm a diabetes and endocrinology physician by background, which is where our piece of work started. Um, and back in the back end of the noughties. Um, and um, what I'd like to do is just introduce you to where we've been. When we thought about this webinar, we thought these might be the sorts of questions that would be important. First, I think understanding what care and support planning is and a bit about the nuts and bolts of how it works. Um, there is, of course, always work involved in changing the way that we deliver care. So what is the work that's involved to extend care and support planning, which I've abbreviated to CSP, for people who have mus musculoskeletal conditions 
bearing in mind that we started somewhere else, and I'll come to that. And then what are the uh, opportunities and challenges of working in this way? And we've done now a pilot that's been running for three years. What is it that we've learned that might be useful to you? And what, where might we be going that you might want to be part of or join in on? So to start with a bit of background on care and support planning itself. Um, care and support planning is something that you, most of you have heard something about. Uh, I guess that's part of the reason why you're here. Um, in, in a sense, the roots of it go back two decades. So even as far back as the NHS plan in 2000, if any of you were still uh, were actually uh, um, around at that time. There was talk about involving patients fully in plans and decisions about their care. And almost every year, there's a new policy document that says we really ought to do this. But as all of us know, policy isn't really enough to, to make change. We have to do something with that policy. So I've included just a couple of areas to think about. <clears throat> the first of these is in front of you at the moment, which is the comprehensive model for personalized care produced by NHS England. And as you'll see, for that 30% of people in the middle, um, uh, care and support planning is a critical part of the way that people with existing health problems, long-term conditions in particular, should have planned and proactive care around uh, whatever conditions they have. Um, in fact, we think probably care and support planning more or less is relevant to all of these three groups, but, but the feeling within policy is particularly this middle group. That's true for England. Um, in Scotland, they got onto this back in 2014. I'm sorry, the, the slide might not be completely clear, but way back when realistic medicine began in Scotland, if any of you are from Scotland, um, I've done something very odd here. Have I? Have you? Have you lost the slides? Yes, we have. Ah, um, I'm not sure what to do there, Sue. Um, can you close that window? Close that box. Yeah, and, and oh yes, we're back. Yeah. Sorry, back in 2014, um, and this thing that you can see here, which is a set of boxes put together, a bit like um, Duplo. Um, this was, what, this was what Scotland took and adapted from the Year of Care House that we had developed. And, and they, they branded it uh, in, under shared decision making, but essentially what they were talking about was care and support planning. On the right hand side of your screen, there is the most recent of the Realistic Medicine uh, publications back in, to, back in 2018 now, where they've extended this to thinking about building a personalized approach to care across the whole system, not just in terms of long-term conditions. So we're very pleased that this is not just part of policy, but is now beginning to become part of action within Scotland and increasingly so within England as well. So what is it, what is it that we're actually talking about? Well, we're talking about a planned and proactive approach, which is structured and which is intended to be forward-looking and replaces what historically has been an annual review for a long-term condition uh, with a planning process that looks not backwards like a headmaster and a pupil reviewing how the term has gone um, and more like a, like a couple of equally, equally balanced adults thinking about where they want to go with something that helps people with a long-term condition to be much more in the driving seat of their health. So we have a number of kind of touch phrases that we use, and one of them is working with people, not doing to people. And that changes some of the ethos around healthcare delivery so that we don't just have people who are passive recipients of care, it does or doesn't stick, to people who become fully engaged and involved. So that's the goal. Um, that goal isn't, although it sounds very laudable, you might worry that it isn't practical. It is actually based on some fairly good sound theory and one of the key bits of theory that we've adopted is uh, or, or modified is something known as the Wagner chronic care model which people may be familiar with it's about 20 25 years old now but Ed Wagner was a health economist based in America who looked at all the developed um, health systems and said what are the things that make the interactions between health professionals and patients effective and productive and cost effective and came up really with two big domains 
one of which was to have engaged and empowered patients, but the other was for the system to be proactive and organised in relation to their health. And that was adopted and built into the National Service Framework back in 2003 uh, for diabetes. And that was, of course, where we were. So back in at that stage, people began to think about this is all very well to have as a theory, but what do we do about it in practice? And the Eurocare programme came out of that as a way of thinking about how we converted what was then the Diabetes Annual Review into something that was more effective. And this slide was produced, was produced from a report in 2006 by the Picker Institute for the Healthcare Commission in which they looked to see what proportion of all adults with diabetes had had some sort of diabetes checkup in the last 12 months. And it was actually nearly all of them. It was very, very good in the sense of a process. But when they dug a bit deeper and asked whether those people had had the chance to discuss the ideas about how to manage their diabetes or, or agree a plan or what their goals were, that ended up being less than half of them. So, uh, so, so that was a real concern and we felt a huge missed, if you like, quality improvement opportunity. And so when, when tenders went out to develop this as a practical intervention back in 2000, end of 2006, beginning of 2007, we stuck our hands up and said, we'd like to be part of that. I have to say, this is to do with diabetes, that those figures in the GP patient survey are fairly similar across all conditions still so that only about 40% of people still have a conversation about what matters to them. Um, and, uh, and yet 93% of people would have found it helpful to have had that and to have had it written down and something to work towards. So although that's been around a long time, uh, across the board in the GP patient survey, there's still quite a lot of work to do, I'm afraid. Another thing which influenced us hugely was this graphic, which um, came out of a World Cafe event. And I won't go into what a World Cafe event is, but the key thing for us is that this is something that somebody wrote about what it's like to live with a long-term condition, but we don't know who the person is. They wrote down their experience on a paper tablecloth and we simply snipped it off the table and thought, gosh, that is really interesting. And two things that it immediately told us Three things. The first is that for people with a long-term condition and with musculoskeletal disease, you'll identify with this strongly, the condition is better or worse at different times. So whether, it's, whether that uh, wavy line goes up when your depression is lighter or your musculoskeletal pain is worse, it doesn't really matter. It goes up and down as you go through your life. And the horizontal lines, which represent your interactions with health professionals, you can see a beautifully regular and organized by the system, but really don't necessarily coincide with when you most need them. Uh, so that was the first thing we took, was that the episodic consultations aren't necessarily at the right time for people or at the point at which they, they would find them most helpful. The second is we recognized very quickly that the amount of time someone spends with a health professional is very small in comparison to all the time that they live with their condition. And therefore, essentially, that all of the real care that's going on is being done by the person themselves. And that may seem very obvious, but it changes the purpose of the episodic consultation. Now, this works really well where there's a condition where there is some form of regular recall. And we were very conscious coming into the world of musculoskeletal conditions that that isn't necessarily the case for many musculoskeletal conditions. So when we thought about the purpose of those two things, then we recognize that the conversations that you have on the orange lines need to be much more helpful for the green line and indeed need to recognize that people do all sorts of things to live well with their condition that may have not much to do with our health systems and that we need to, we need to understand those, supplement them, strengthen them and if we possibly can stimulate them. And that became quite important and is quite an important theme of what we do. We also realised that for people to make the very most of those visits, they need to be prepared for them so that they come into the visit with the same approach uh, and the same understanding that the healthcare professional has. And that dynamically changes the conversation that is then taking place. So we have changed some of the language as we've gone along 
we no longer routinely talk about consultations, we talk about conversations because they're more balanced in terms of power gradient. We think the conversation is, we know from experience hugely, that the conversation is different when the person is ready for the consultation, understands its purpose, and has had time to think about it. And we've developed a range of agenda setting prompts and information that can help people to think that through and come into the consultation much better prepared. Uh, and that means that the conversation itself is much more time efficient and we get towards goals and actions more quickly. So to summarize the process that we had when we started out, we started off with um, some information gathering because we were dealing with diabetes and then cardiovascular disease where there are some biomedical metrics that are helpful in that conversation, but we realized the person needs that. So we ended up with a two-step approach with a visit to a healthcare assistant to collect the information and then a process of sharing by the practices that gives the person time enough to have a bit of a think, maybe talk to people, look stuff up if they want, and come into the subsequent conversation already prepared with some ideas checking on the things that are going on, considering what's important, uh, and then exploring and developing a plan and some actions around that. And that's been highly successful with patients and they massively appreciated it. It's probably worth stepping back for a moment to recognize that this is a process that happens in the context of people with an established long-term condition. In other words, their long-term condition is uh, for life, but it's not in a diagnostic stage. So we reckon, so we've, we developed in diabetes something called the diabetes tadpole, which recognizes there's a period in people's life when there's a diagnosis being made, then there's some initial sorting out and management. There should be some structured patient education, which is there for most people with diabetes, not always used very well, but it's there, um, but not necessarily for all conditions. And then they go into this cycle of review, preparation, uh, uh, the, the conversation and then actions which can then be followed through, through either management, self-management, traditional services, non-traditional community support or care coordination. So a whole range of different things can come out of the conversation. But our work is in this part of the tadpole, is in the head of the tadpole. And this is just a, a, a graphic of some of the things that can come out. We don't know what patients are going to think is important to them when they go into a consultation. So our hope is that at the end of it, they have identified the things that are going to be helpful coming out, which may be just dealing with pain and working with the escape pain program. It might be that the person actually identifies that smoking is important and some clinical and social input. It may be all sorts of different things, some of which are medical and some of which are community and some of which are uh, techie, which I don't understand hugely, but it's still uh, something that people can find really helpful. And there may be this person who basically says, I'm doing all of the things that I need to do. Thank you very much. I just want to know that you're there and I can call you if I need you. And that becomes something that can be a useful output. So we're not suggesting futile activities to people who aren't going to engage in them. And then our role is to help people to do that and to develop those services where they're not there or to support them where they are. So coming back to what people really value, uh, this got us thinking about what does it look like if you're a person with a long-term condition or even multiple long-term conditions. And on the left-hand side, this is really what doctors and health professionals and sometimes the system thinks about. We have lots of labels in there. We have some stuff around mood. Um, interestingly, this was not for, for arthritis particularly, but arthritis figures very highly for many people. So we've labeled people with all of these things. But when we ask people, they think about them very differently. They think about them in terms of identity and stigma and loss and fear. And if we don't join those two agendas up, then we, we're likely to be very ineffective in what we're doing. So all of this underpins what we do. And there's some theory behind this. This is some work from, um, um, so, from some, some of our friends up in Aberdeen who have really said that historically what we think about is managing a condition well and what we need to do that with that. And that's quite narrow and assumes that the condition is a very large and important part of someone's life, which it may or may not be, rather than how the person lives well, 
who happens to have a condition and we bring some expertise and some support to that. And that is likely to be a much more effective approach and is certainly what patients say they want. Just for what it's worth, we're now 10 years old. Uh, our goal is to make this the normal for everybody with a long-term condition. Uh, and this is a, a, a graphic from National Voices um, who came up with what they thought the principles of care and support planning should be, which map beautifully to what we were doing. And we've made some adaptations as well based on this. Um, but we've also been rolling this out for single conditions, uh, and that's Glenn Park, who then took it into multiple long-term conditions. We've looked at it in people who are housebound in Cumbria, and we're looking at it in people who have frailty. Um, so we're looking at across the board. Um, I think I'm just gonna pause for a moment and just go back and say, I think it's important probably to say that this isn't simply a trick or a technique within a consultation, we've recognized that for this central activity to work well, there are a whole lot of other things that need to be in place. These two walls reflect the two sides of the chronic care model that Wagner proposed, that is engaged and informed patients and a system that's committed to partnership working. But when we thought about this in the early part of the project that we did between 2007 and 2010, we realize that if you're doing this in primary care, which is our focus, then there are a whole bunch of bits that need to go on within the practice and a whole set of skills, attitudes and activities within that practice that are essential to making that happen. But also that, and I'm glad there are some commissioners here, that there are things that you need to plan into the system, across the system and support for this to happen really well within your locality. So we've ended up with this sort of arrangement and we ended up calling it a house because it fitted and because houses need all of their component parts to not fall down or leak. So what about um, care and support planning in a musculoskeletal setting? Um, uh, in 2014, we, well, 2013, we started meeting with what was then Arthritis Research UK, has subsequently joined and become part of Versus Arthritis um, to think about what were the challenges and the opportunities within musculoskeletal conditions. And we recognized that they had been almost completely left out of the thinking around this and that something needed to happen for this to become a reality for a huge group of people, which I'll come to some numbers later, but a huge group of people who could potentially benefit. The outcome of this piece of work was really to say that this needs to happen for uh, people with musculoskeletal disease, it needs to be normal, but we don't know quite what needs to be done for that to take place. So in 2000, between 2016 and the early part of this year, we've run a, a, a pilot to try to look at that. And the pilot's been in two parts. It's, it, we've started off with uh, three practices, just looking at the components that were needed, if you can remember the house, what are the bits and pieces that are needed and how do they differ from other conditions and we started in all of these practices in places that were already doing care and support planning so they had the infrastructure within the practice already set up but what would be needed for people with musculoskeletal conditions to experience this as a normal thing of routine practice um, and what would be the differences for those who had musculoskeletal conditions alone or musculoskeletal conditions with other things after the first year of developing the tools and systems, we extended it to more practices to look at transferability, which was very successful, but we learned more lessons still as you always do. We wanted to look at links with specialist services and supporting activities in the community. To some degree, we probably aren't gonna to get to that till we implement it across a whole health economy, a sort of local health economy. Um, because uh, we can't influence the other bits if there are only a few practices in each health economy doing it. Our first question as we approached this was to ask why musculoskeletal conditions aren't already a part of this. And we, the, our first observation was that they're not, many of them are not quaff conditions. So quaff has its detractors and its advocates. But what it did do, amongst other things, is it created a financial incentive to focus on particular long-term conditions where there were uh, benefits, points means prizes, so there were benefits to the practice from doing particular things and achieving particular outcomes, 
we would argue the patients achieve the outcomes, but, but for those outcomes to be apparent. Um, and most people with a musculoskeletal condition would not in and of itself be part of a quaff condition process. So that made us unsure how big the piece of work would be. The second is that within practices, they don't, because, they, because there's no quaff incentive to do it, they don't have registers and processes around musculoskeletal conditions. But we also discovered that in organizational training and confidence terms, lots of the people who now deliver long-term conditions care, which is the practice nurses, don't have the confidence or the skills necessarily to do this. And then finally, we recognize that all of us feel a bit overwhelmed by the scale of the problem and that we needed to find a way through that. So our first question was who amongst all the people with musculoskeletal conditions should be included and how big was the problem? And when we did our first cut of the read codes for people with musculoskeletal conditions, we realized that more or less half of every practice have a label of a musculoskeletal condition. There was no distinction when you looked at that between necessarily between people having a long-term condition or an event. And so there was a, there's been a huge amount of cleaning up of practice registers and allocation of people into different categories uh, that's, that's had to be done at the start. So there is work before people even begin this. It delivers you about 15% of your population, which if you think about a practice of 10,000 is about 1,500 patients, and that's a lot of patients. But we also realized that about a half to a third of these people are already being seen for a different long-term condition within a care and support planning process. And that meant that we probably have 800 people within a practice that we don't know about who might benefit from care and support planning. And because the numbers were still substantial, we decided that we would let people choose for themselves whether they thought this would be a good idea. And so we invited them to opt in. Now we don't know for sure that there are people who might benefit who didn't stick their hands up or whether there are people who might not benefit much who did stick their hands up. But we do know that that reduced the numbers to about half of what it had been. So there are about 400 new, uh, new bespoke appointments needing to be made. They could potentially of course be offset against um, opportunistic appointments that people have to deal with their musculoskeletal conditions at other times, but it is work that needs to be organized. We decided that we had to work out who we should even invite, and so we took the versus arthritis three big groups of conditions, inflammatory conditions, some of which do have some quaff attached to them in the specialist setting, some of which have quaff attached to them in primary care, but are are only really done as biochemical monitoring processes in primary care largely. The middle one, which we think is a huge group of people where in a sense there is no structure or incentive at all and represents uh, more than half of all of the patients that we invited. Um, and people who have risk, but no, not necessarily a current issue, uh, but who, for whom risk management would be important. So just to come to what we found, I'm conscious of time, and I don't really want to get too far behind. What we discovered was, yes, you can add on uh, care and support planning for people with musculoskeletal conditions where the practices are already set up for it. There is work that's needed to implement this, particularly work in identifying the right people and inviting them. And even for people who've been coming giving them uh, the opportunity to think about specifically their musculoskeletal condition in relation to a care and support planning appointment that may be for several different conditions because we don't see people for them separately. We think it's about people, not diseases, that that gives people permission to talk about things. And we found patients talking about things and saying to us, this is the first time I've really had the opportunity to talk about this and it's really the big thing in my life. We, we did put in place some training that I'll talk about in a moment, but that allowed practitioners to become much more confident with musculoskeletal conditions. We found lots of the solutions were generated by the people themselves rather than the practitioner. Um, every patient we spoke to said they would recommend it and thought it was a, a massive improvement. And all of the practices that were involved wanted to carry on, um, even though there had been major challenges in getting it set. Well, there have been challenges in getting it set up. In terms of what we needed to do to get people ready for it, we realized that people can be a bit fatalistic. People have got used to us 
not really addressing the critical issue for them with their musculoskeletal conditions. And we also realized that language was important. So we went to our local reference group. We involved one in Gateshead who said to us, what the heck is MSK? So we obviously had to translate med speak into something human at times. Um, and we realized that for some conditions, there wasn't actually any data that needed to be gathered. So if you've got pain, uh, fibromyalgia, osteoarthritis, there isn't a blood test needed, but the preparing and stimulating people to think about their, their consultation in advance, their conversation was very powerful still. So we've developed all sorts of resources around that. And within the consultation, we realized that people are more ready to talk about their musculoskeletal conditions if they've been having care and support planning. But for those without, this was seen as a massive new benefit to them. Um, and, they, and they really, really, really liked it. I'm just gonna talk very briefly about the training. So within the training setting, we asked uh, within the first part of the pilot, we asked people what, what were the main things that they talked about. And you can see from this pie chart that pain was overwhelmingly the most common thing. Osteoarthritis, which may be just about their pain and quite a lot about medications that patients wanted to talk about and mobility. And if you put those four topics together, they account for half of all of the things that the person brought to the consultation. When we talked to the practitioners, we discovered that they actually felt quite anxious about talking about pain. Nurses felt quite anxious about talking about medication and mobility felt as if it was something that they weren't sure about either and would refer on to somebody else. So there was a, there was a genuine need to upskill the practitioners about um, th these areas, particularly pain, um, and to have them much more confident in the conversations that they had. So we put on some training. It was two full days of training. The first of which was identifying where the practices were in terms of their confidence around these areas and what training they would want um, and introducing them to the escape pain program. And the second of which involved getting a consultant rheumatologist along to talk about some of the biomedical dimensions of pain, to talk about the role of the specialist service in relation to primary care. Um, and, and we brought along a pain specialist nurse, the escape pain people, and we all had a bit of fun with Tai Chi at lunchtime and realized that Tai Chi was really quite a good thing that it, and that sort of thing would be helpful to our patients. So the practitioners went away very much more confident, particularly around managing pain, around managing pain medications, about understanding their role as against the role of a specialist service and really were hugely helped. We also think there's some in-house training and support that will always be needed between GPs around drugs and nurses. So there's some training for the GPs to do that as well. In relation to pain, uh, what outcomes did we have? We, 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 as I said, we identified it as the most common single concern. Over the course of a year in the second part of our pilot, there was actually no prescribing of opiates or gabapentin, which is an interesting observation, but there was some use of um, community-based activities and non-traditional uh, support that, that, the, that the practitioners felt much more confident about directing people to. So what was the feedback we had? I'm just going to put this up. Um, these are some of the bits of um, these are some of the bits of feedback we had from patients. Um, some of them felt very strongly. You can see um, uh, uh, it's, it's it's interesting. They used quite strong language. Um, they were very enthusiastic. And as I say, no, some for some people to say that getting the prompt sheet, which is what the yellow form was, uh, in advance. Um, making their days a bit strong, but actually that is how the patient felt. It gave them a real sense of an opportunity to talk about things they've been desperate to talk about. So brilliantly received by patients. What about practitioners? Because if the practitioners aren't keen, it's hard to make anything happen. Of course, practitioners are much more wordy, but essentially people were coming away feeling that a morning of hard work had actually been a morning that was worthwhile. And in an NHS that feels a bit ground down, that's quite a gift to the NHS. Some people just said it made sense. Why aren't we doing, why weren't we doing it before? There were some anxieties that weren't realized at the end. And there was a recognition of a different dynamic that was going on between practitioners and patients. So we felt very, very, very positive about that. 
in terms of impact, um, patients would recommend it. We've got uh, dozens and dozens of stories, but there's new work to, do, to, to be done around unmet need. But that work, we think, once it begins to be met, will not come out as problems further down the track within the system. Um, all of the practices want to continue and would like the support to continue. And there is some change in the choices that are being made, which we thought was very positive. Now, this isn't a big enough study across the whole system quite to tell us what, will, what, what that will turn into in terms of benefit to the system as a whole. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a heads up about where we might be going. We've been in conversations with versus arthritis who've been very positive about this to think about working across what, what people like to call health ecologies. So it wouldn't just be uh, a group of five practices in Gateshead as it was for part two of the program, but it might be the whole of Gateshead who have already um, uh, started to introduce career support planning, now working out how to do that in addition with musculoskeletal conditions. We, we have recognized that there is some transitional training needed. We know what that is. But versus arthritis have said, look, they're interested in the whole of the head of the tadpole. If you remember that graphic, they would like us to help them to reshape that so that even where care and support planning isn't in place, people are beginning to have different types of conversation. Um, and we'd like, as we start to roll it out to health ecologies, to look at the wider impact and almost the health economic impact as well. Uh, you will get, and here is some resources that you could tap into, but please also sign yourselves up for the Versus Arthritis and Eurocare newsletters, so we'll keep you up to date, or send us an email. And I think Sue's gonna send you around this information um, uh, later. So finally, just from my point of view, just to acknowledge and say thank you. Thank you to Arma for inviting us to this webinar. Thank you to all of the people who've worked over the years in the Eurocare team who've made this possible some of whom have moved on and are now doing this stuff in, in other parts of their lives. Thank you to Burst Arthritis for making the, the, the project possible uh, and the Arthritis Research UK for kicking it off. Huge thank you to all of the teams that were involved. And I just a word about Nidri. Those of you, that, if you're in Scotland, will know that Nidri is the most deprived ward in Scotland. Uh, we picked them deliberately because we thought if it could work in Nidri, it can more or less work anywhere. Um, and the Gateshead Arthritis Support Group, and finally to all of you for coming and joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, that was a, a very useful and interesting presentation. If people have questions, um, now is the time to put those in the Q&A box and uh, Nick will endeavour to answer them. As he said, everyone on this, everyone signed up to this webinar should get an email um, <coughs> week which will contain the links to things that were on the slides and some of the references um, so if you want to just uh, pop any questions you have in the Q&A box um, one of the other things that I think is we sometimes do on our webinars and is good is if there's anything that you are thinking of doing differently or trying out as a result of the webinar pop that into the chat box um, and share that with everyone you should have the ability to share it with all of the part attendees as well as panelists uh, it's just quite nice for people to see what other people might be thinking of doing as a result um, and, and one of the things I found fascinating in your presentation Nick was that um, you had people coming in for care and support planning process for conditions other than MSK who clearly mm -hmm. had an MSK condition but that mm -hmm. wasn't being discussed until mm -hmm. you actually explicitly put MSK on the agenda and I know one of the things that Armour is trying, trying to try and do um, in the coming year is to try and raise the understanding of non-MSK clinicians of the importance of people's MSK health for their underlying health. Yeah. Um, I, if I can comment on that, I think part of that is that there is there really is a genuine lack of confidence on the part of the people who are doing most of the care and support planning Indeed, most of the long-term conditions review even outside that context. And those are increasingly practice nurses and less and less GPs. When they're faced with pain or things about medication, it's quite anxiety provoking. They don't really feel confident with it. And part of what we realized we needed to do was to help people to be more skillful at that. So 
so there is a little bit of reluctance on professionals part as well as tentativeness on the part of um of of the patients themselves mm -hmm. so we've got some questions coming in now so right. we start at the top i don't know if we want to just read them off or or for me to read them out so the first one is have you considered using a pam i think that's patient activation measure yeah. in yeah. the parent support yeah. planning process how does that relate yes. Well, well, PAM is a measure, so it isn't an intervention in and of itself. Um, we, we, we're, we're conscious that PAM is being quite widely used, and that means that it's already something that people will have familiar, familiarity with. So it's mostly a measure of people's uh, activation, that is their readiness to, and their confidence in managing their own health. Um, as such, it's useful. We feel it probably gets a bit of a reductionist approach. In other words, it gets boiled down to a score that somebody has. And without a clear path to what you do about that score. So, we, so it could be quite useful as an evaluation tool, but it's, we think it's probably of limited use when compared with just asking people what they want to talk about in a clinical setting, because asking people what they want to talk about gets you straight to the heart of what they want to talk about. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and um, possibly leads on to the next question, what people want to okay. talk about. So, which is, is work and managing work with a long-term MSK condition one of the aspects you're looking at in care and support planning? So the work for work? professionals, is that? Sorry? Is that the work for the teams? Um, ha I think we're talking here about people in employment who also okay. have a MSK yes. condition. I'm assuming yes. that's what's meant. Yes. Well, if, if work is something that is important to them, then it becomes important in the conversation. So it's very much the patient will be setting an agenda. It, it's not, they may not set all of the agenda because there may be very important medical things or health things that we think need to be brought up. So it is a partnership approach, um, but very much uh, the idea that if someone says, look, work is an important thing, work may be the most important thing. If someone's at risk of not being employed, I, I live and work in the Northeast of England, um, if someone's thinking about being unemployed, the opportunities for them to become re-employed are very limited here. And so if work's the critical thing, then we have to almost to put on one side some of the health issues, address the work things, and then we can come back to the health issues either in the same consultation if there's time and opportunity, or plan to come back to them later. So absolutely work is important, um, uh, as would be pain, as would be m mobility, We've discovered that social isolation is a huge thing for people with musculoskeletal conditions because they sometimes can't get out of the house and some of their social connections get lost. So there are all sorts of things that end up coming up that might be really valuable to people in their lives. Did work come up at all in your training? Because I know this is one thing that... No, it didn't. It didn't. Um, it, didn't come up as a, it didn't come up as a big topic and we were a bit surprised. Um, and it didn't come up... Um, as something that the health professionals felt they had particular learning needs around. So I'm, you know, it is a bit surprising, but it didn't come up as a big thing. Okay. And, and from Arma's point of view, that might be, would that be surprising, Sue, from where you sit? Um, yes, it, in the sense that it's one of the two biggest causes of days lost at work, muscular skills yes. and mental yeah. health yeah. Are the, are the way. Yeah top two yeah. um so it it we know it's a big issue and we know it's a big issue for people with msk conditions who really want yeah. to continue in work yeah of yeah struggling to know what's the best way to address all of that yeah it's probably worth saying that this this process of care support planning is something that is done in a proactive and organized way just once a year at the moment and because of that all of the people that we looked at we're experiencing it for the first time in relation to MSK conditions. And it may well be that they have a priority list and that the priority list is first getting out of the house and then getting to work and then all of the things that go with that. So we don't know whether that will be something that, that floats up to the surface as other unmet need gets dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's a possibility, but we don't know. And something longer and, and broader would help to answer that. And, I'm going to suggest that we stick it down on our list of things to think about in the next iteration. Definitely. Um, so we've then got a question about whether there's a need for a standardised clinical tool 
to be implemented alongside the approach to track the patient and clinical benefit a bit okay. like the diagnostic markers used in diabetes and yes. would the MSKHQ be suitable for this? Well, we looked in detail at MSKHQ actually, um, and there were various things about it that we, we, did, we looked at it in two respects. We looked at it in, in the sense of, was it a useful evaluation tool for benefit? And, and because the range of topics that patients brought up aren't really mirrored completely in the MSKHQ, we felt it missed the mark a bit. We also felt that um, it, was quite, it, it was quite difficult to fill in. We'd originally wanted it to be filled in by a person electronically and then be able to be incorporated directly into the practice so that the health professional could see what people were saying about their uh, MSK disability before they came into the room and was up to date with that. Um, but that has proved to be quite a problem and, and the NHS IT just makes that very difficult to do. Um, we, we thought about it then as an evaluation tool, but part of the dilemma is that questionnaires are quite cumbersome for evaluation and they, they add hugely to the burden for patients. So the patients just didn't fill them in. Um, and then we wondered whether, so, so we used it in two ways. We used it as a preparation tool, which we felt we couldn't easily incorporate into busy general practice. And we looked at it as an evaluation tool, but we, thought, we felt it gave, it gave too coarse uh, a, a granularity in terms of being able to see a difference and was quite burdensome to people to fill in. So it's potentially there, but we're not sure quite how well it'll work. But it is a good thought and we very much wanted to do it and we wanted it to work. We just couldn't make it work that well. Okay. Um, and then the next question is, I think you've enthused at least one person on this call. If there's anyone who's a health or care practice and is interested in implementing this, what are the next steps and how do you obtain the read codes for MSK and carry out the cleaning that you mentioned about the patient group? Yeah, so we've got some tools and we're happy to share those. And if that, if that practice is part of the uh, extended, um, we've, we've got a sort of community of interest in relation to the year of care approach, please contact us through that. We'd be happy to share those. Um, because we like to act as a bit of a, a resource hub for people who are doing it, um, on a bigger scale, um, we think that the next stage for us will involve going out to localities that are already doing care and support planning and seeing if they're interested in extending it into musculoskeletal conditions and there would therefore be support more locally in that system to do some of that work. Um, we think we will know sort of in the early quarter of next year, I'm just looking at my colleague here who, who's, who's our project manager. Um, in, the, in the first quarter of next year, we, we, we will have a much stronger sense of direction. So stay in touch. Um, please flag your interest with us through the Year of Care address or through the addresses you have with the team. And we will keep you in mind, but we would love a local champion already there who thinks their locality is right for this. So there we go. There's a challenge to everyone on the call. Will you be that local champion? Let us know. Um, so the next question is about group consultations. How does this work with group consultations? Mm. Um, we're very interested in group consultations, actually. We think they have huge potential. Um, it's quite important to decide what their purpose is. And I think in our thinking, group consultations are a brilliant way of exploring general themes around having a particular condition and, and strengthening peer-to-peer -peer support. We think they work very well for that. They might be more difficult to use in the context of individuals deciding what, what they want to achieve over the next period of time and what are the specific actions that they will do to achieve that, which is what we end up with in a care and support planning conversation. So, so we, we are unsure the extent to which things can be grouped up. But we do think there's a very useful role, I think particularly for musculoskeletal conditions where there aren't, as I understand, I might be wrong about this, but lots of uh, patient uh, education and training programs in existence, there might be real opportunities to help people to understand what it is I've got, share experience, 
discover what solutions other people have found, um, and 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 get to grips with the general themes. Um, I don't know whether whether because I'm not a a rheumatologist or a practitioner in musculoskeletal conditions as a primary thing. I'm conscious of all sorts of weird and cranky health beliefs that people have around diabetes that are built up from all sorts of perfectly reasonable places, but it all just get glued together in a funny way. Uh, and they come into the clinic and they say, but of course X, and you go, oh, that sounds a bit strange. Maybe we need to unpick that a bit. And I think groups are a fantastic way of having in a sense a common understanding between health professionals and people. Um, so I think that that role to them, for them is very strong. So I think they have an educational development, uh, um, uh, reflective role for patients and provide person to person support. Whether you can do care support planning with them, we, we, we've not really been able to work out a way to do that. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And um, then there's a, a question about the actual process for this. Based on what you've presented, it seems like there isn't a two-step appointment for this group, okay. just the care and support appointment. Is that correct? And how long is that appointment? Okay, so there isn't a first appointment where there isn't some biomedical data to collect. So for gout or inflammatory arthritis, there is something that you would want to know um, about that person in relation to, let's say, their inflammatory markers or their urate level or whatever that might feed into your consultation. Um, but that is actually not a large proportion of all of these people. So for many of them, it's about a self-assessment of how they feel they're getting on and what difference their condition makes to them. Um, so there isn't. So for those people that there isn't, we have a set of consultation prompts, we call it a notice board, where people can pick off, we, we make some, we, we've defined some very broad areas that we put out there, but we ask people to think in advance of their consultation about what areas there are. Maybe some people think about these. For those that do, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a meeting with a healthcare professional that takes 15 to 20 minutes, uh, is run, we have templates that help people to get the right stuff into the right place. And if the person has several conditions, which may require several bits of information gathered for the different conditions, we've got what we call smart templates that will pick off the quaff, uh, will pick off the read codes and populate a template that then allows the healthcare system just to run down the list of them. So if you like, all the tasks and tests, if there are any, are done in a 15 to 20 minute meeting with the health, uh, healthcare assistant um, about two weeks before the consultation. Okay, great. Is that, is, is, that, is that an answer to the question? Have I got that? Have I nailed that one? Have I got that one? No, yes. Hopefully, yeah, okay, good. the question I will come back if not. Um, good. On the read codes and the question, are the, yeah. have you got the right read codes? How does one identify the right patient okay. around MSK? What are the issues there? Okay, so, so, so there was a process that, uh, and we've got, we've got a process. It is, it is to some degree manual. So there's a process that a practice would need to go through to clean out an awful lot of stuff that just simply has got historically labeled as something and then needs to be uh, put on one side in things that are not active or current. Then what the practices were doing was spending about an hour a week with, uh, with, the, with the lead doctor and nurse, looking at people who would be coming up in their birth month, I should have said, we, we tend to try and tag the care support planning a conversation to someone's birth month because it's something everyone can remember and it spreads the work out across the year. But they would spend about an hour a week just looking at the people whose names would be coming up and reorganizing their read codes. If they were appropriate for care and support planning, there is a bespoke care and support planning read code incidentally we discovered which you could then attach to that person, which next year means you don't have to go through the whole process again. So over the course of two or three years, your, 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 your register develops uh, based on the care and support planning read code, which will now of course um, be a SNOMED code, but, but essentially becomes a code that identifies that person as being appropriate for care and support planning where they didn't have a quaff code that helped. Okay, does, does, right. Yeah, so it, it's, it's work in the first year that gets substantially less in the second, third, and, and should be by the fourth year almost not happening. 
Okay, great. And the next question is clearly from someone who's been very enthused by your presentation. Um, and it's about the training, because it says, is there a plan to roll out the training on a massive scale national, nationwide? Yes, not by us though. So, <laughs> so, so that if, if we were going to work with a local community, we would embed that training into the work that we did with that community. Um, Versus arthritis are very keen though for the elements of that training to form a module that they use for the, for the training that they're already developing around musculoskeletal condition for primary, conditions for primary care. So as I say, they've worked quite hard on the tail of the tadpole, the initial diagnosis, the initial management, how one goes through those processes, chooses medications at the start of a diagnosis of a musculoskeletal condition. But they, but they have looked at what we've done and said that this would be really, really helpful for the head of the tadpole. So we're working with Kate Croxton in Versus Arthritis to develop the work that's needed, or to, to, to identify, if you like, the curriculum and the content for training that will both support the transition from care and support planning for other conditions into musculoskeletal conditions, and at the same time, would be facing towards practices that aren't at the moment doing care and support planning, but would like some support around musculoskeletal conditions that complements the, the stuff that's already there from versus arthritis. Right. And they want to, I think they more or less want to make that something that all practices can access. Excellent. So anyone on this call who's wanting to get stuck into this, there will be training coming. Um, a couple more questions we've probably just got time to very quickly cover. So um, follow up, this is a question about work. Yeah. Is the point at which someone goes off on sickness absence with an MSK condition long term, would mm. that be the point to try and implement care and support planning? That's a good question. Um, I, I think probably not because the, the desire in care and support planning is to keep the agenda initially very broad and then actually then to filter it down and get it very specific. Um, I think if they've already decided that they need to stop work, care and support planning has either missed an opportunity, you know, there's a might have been something modifiable further upstream, or the person will be moving on to a different agenda, um, which is how am I going to live when I'm not at work, uh, which may be more about finances and housing and benefits than it is about work. So I think that would be something that would be a conversation between the annual cycle but it would be in, in response to an event that's occurred. This person's now reached a, a tipping point in relation to work. What are the issues here? I would say that the approach, which is a partnership approach, should happen in every consultation, but it might not require the structure of, of the preparation and then the subsequent um, uh, giving back of results if there are results to give back. I think because I'm a secondary care doctor, I probably think a bit too much about inflammatory arthritis, if I'm honest. Um, so I can see that you wouldn't necessarily have all of that stuff to talk about and whether that matters. So I'm, I'm not sure that it would be exactly the right time. You want to do it at a time when someone's planning, but not necessarily in crisis. Okay, great. And I'm going to read out this last question. Mm. Um, very briefly, we support many patients with long-term MSK conditions on a maintenance pathway oh. in a complementary mm. AHP teaching setting outside the NHS. How would you potentially integrate with care and support planning? That's a really good question too. And, the, and because I'm conscious of time, the answer to that is we think that care and support planning should be happening within the medical setting. So it's the healthcare system. But we recognise that there are all sorts of really important things where they're there, it's fantastic, that are happening outside the healthcare setting, which we would want to link with with care and support planning. So within the care and support planning, if there are things that help and support people outside it, then that those GPs would be, if, if once we've trained them, would be biting your arm off to make use of the things that you're doing and to be able to signpost people towards them where what you offer is actually more relevant and effective than the things that we might have up our sleeves to offer. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to Nick for presenting a really good presentation. Thank you to everyone for engaging and for your questions. Hope you all found it useful. And uh, the recording will be available online shortly and you will get a link to it. Um, please share it with anyone else that you think might find it useful. Um,